Nearly a year ago, at the beginning of 2022, the Russian armed forces deployed tens of thousands of troops into Belarus, a relatively small country of about 9 million people whose government is a very close ally of the Kremlin and whose territory is immediately to the west of Russia and to the north of Ukraine. Belarus's southern border with Ukraine extends for more than a thousand kilometers across largely flat, open, and marshy terrain, and is crucially placed fewer than 90 kilometers away from Ukraine's capital and largest city. Kyiv. These facts make Belarus a vitally strategic location for Russia's invasion plans into Ukraine. And so, after Belarus allowed the Russians to pile up around 30,000 of their troops on the southern border in February of 2022, the Russians launched their initial blitzkrieg attack by storming across the border towards Kyiv. Their objective was to quickly occupy and conquer the Ukrainian capital, overthrow the government of Volodymyr Zelensky, and force a quick end to the war on Russia's own terms which would have likely involved establishing a puppet government in Ukraine that would have granted the Russians their desired territorial conquests in the East. But of course, that's not how things ended up turning out. Ukrainian resistance was significantly fiercer than the Russians had anticipated, while the Russians' own logistics, planning, equipment, and morale proved significantly worse than they initially believed. After suffering thousands of casualties and failing to capture Kyiv, the surviving Russians withdrew back across the border towards the safety of Belarus, and left a path of scorched earth behind in their wake, like in Bucha, where hundreds of civilians and prisoners of war had been hastily shot. But Russian missile systems and artillery based within Belarus have continued to bomb targets within Ukraine throughout the months of the war that have followed. And now, it appears that yet another Russian attack from Belarus against Kyiv may be building and coming very soon. Western satellite images have revealed increasingly concentrated military activity within Belarus near to the Ukrainian border. It's now estimated by Western intelligence that around 20,000 Russian troops have entered the country once again and are massing in the south near the border with Ukraine. Railways from Russia have been flowing through Belarus with military hardware and equipment, and brand new roads are being sliced through the forest towards the border. These are all troubling signs that could be pointing towards a second Russian attack from Belarus on the Ukrainian capital nearly a year after the first attempt failed. And there are fears that this time, the Belarusian army itself may be joining in alongside the Russians in the attack. But if that's true, why has it taken this long for Belarus, a nominal ally of Russia, to formally join the Russians in the invasion of Ukraine? Why has Belarus continuously granted the Russian military safe passage through their country and access to their bases to attack Ukraine from without formally committing their own troops alongside them? And why might that all suddenly be changing now? To answer those questions, we just have to go back a couple years to the events that took place in Belarus during 2020. But in order to understand those events, you have to understand a bit about the man who rules over Belarus. You see, ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union back in the early 1990s, Belarus has only ever been ruled by a single man. Alexander Lukashenko. He came to power in the first and only free election ever to be held in Belarusian history in 1994, and has claimed to have won every single election in the country ever since, a claim that much of the rest of the outside world ardently disagrees with. He has self-identified as the last dictator in Europe, while his regime in Belarus has often been considered as Europe's most heavily authoritarian. His ideology and goals have been to effectively preserve Belarus as a miniature surviving version of the Soviet Union. Large amounts of the Belarusian economy are still owned by the state. The flag used by his regime is essentially the same one that was used by the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, with the only significant modification being the removal of the old hammer and sickle. The regime has sidelined the Belarusian language in favor of Russian. Both are technically official languages of the state, but by 2020, nearly 90% of children in Belarus were attending Russian language schools. And Russian remains the dominant language in nearly every aspect of public life, making it really the de facto language of the country. According to a Belarusian government study from 2009, only 12% of the Belarusian population actively used the Belarusian language at all, while the overwhelming majority used Russian. The Belarusian State Security Service even kept its old name and acronym from the Soviet era as well, the infamous KGB. 
Freedom of the press and civil liberties are each low, as insulting Lukashenko personally is punishable by up to a five-year prison sentence, while criticizing the Belarusian government from outside of the country is punishable with up to a two-year prison sentence. In 2021, Reporters Without Borders ranked Belarus 28th from the bottom out of all the world's countries on press freedoms, nearly on a par with Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. And in addition to that, Belarus is also the final country in Europe to continue administering the death penalty for crimes, most often carried out by a single gunshot to the back of the head. More than 30 years now after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Belarus remains a pocket of Soviet-era authoritarianism in the center of Europe. And that means that, consequently, Lukashenko has kept his Soviet-nostalgic authoritarian regime very closely aligned with the similarly authoritarian and Soviet-nostalgic regime of Vladimir Putin in Russia. And that's why in 1999, Belarus and Russia signed a treaty that established what's known as the Union State between them. The original goal of that treaty was to eventually unify both Russia and Belarus back into a single new state. A sort of first step towards rebuilding something out of the Soviet Union's many shattered pieces. And in the decades ever since, there have been a lot of attempts to move closer towards that goal. Russian and Belarusian citizens are each allowed to freely travel, live, and work in each other's countries as if they already are a unified state. The Russian and Belarusian armed forces frequently conduct joint military exercises together, while their officers are often trained together in the same schools. There have also been talks going back decades now of establishing a common currency between Russia and Belarus, like the Euro in the European Union. But all those talks have so far ultimately led to nowhere, just as the talks for eventual full-on unification between Russia and Belarus. But nonetheless, Lukashenko's Belarus has remained closely aligned with Russia in nearly every conceivable measure just short of full-on unification. Belarus is, after all, a member of the Russian-led military alliance CSTO, essentially Moscow's own version of NATO consisting of multiple states that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. Simultaneously, Belarus is also a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is basically Moscow's own version of the European Union. So, while Belarus hasn't yet formally joined Russia in a truly unified state, Lukashenko's Belarus has nonetheless been extremely loyal to Russia and Russian geopolitical interests. And so, Russia would ideally like to keep Lukashenko around there. In stark contrast to Ukraine, which eventually began drifting away from Moscow's orbit and towards the European Union and NATO. But that doesn't mean that there aren't cracks just beneath the surface within Belarus. Western observers have categorized every single election in the country ever since the 1994 one as rigged and fraudulent. And by this point, everyone in the country who's 28 years old or younger has only ever known Lukashenko as their leader and his authoritarian regime as their government, while also living directly next door to three European Union member states. So, after Lukashenko supposedly won re-election in 2010, protests broke out against him that were harshly repressed by the Belarusian police. Hundreds of people were arrested, including seven out of nine of Lukashenko's political opponents from the election. Among them, this guy, Andrei Sonikov, who was the guy that received the most votes out of all the opposition candidates and who was subsequently held for 16 months and tortured before being pardoned and released in 2012. He fled the country in exile to London almost immediately after he was released, where he has remained ever since. The 2015 presidential elections were considered similarly fraudulent, with Lukashenko allegedly receiving more than 84% of all the votes. But there was less violence and mass arrests than in the previous 2010 election. But then came the pivotal election in 2020, where Lukashenko's then 26-year-long regime was nearly toppled from power by internal pro-Western opposition groups. A complete nightmare scenario for the Kremlin had it actually happened. Svetlana Siganuskaya emerged as the primary political opponent to Lukashenko's regime after her husband, who had been running before her, was arrested and denied the ability to legally run himself. Siganuskaya ran on a pro-democracy platform that advocated for freeing all of Belarus's political prisoners and terminating the Union State Treaty with Russia, which would have effectively ended all discussions on Belarus ever unifying with Russia. Fully expecting the 2020 election to be rigged like all of the previous ones had been, she 
urged her followers to use their smartphones to take pictures of their ballots and upload them all to a database. Those photos could then be compared against the official election results announced by the Belarusian government. And sure enough, the government quickly announced after the polls had closed that Lukashenko had supposedly won with more than 4.6 million votes, representing 81% of the total, compared to Siganuskaya's 588,000, representing only 10% of the total. However, the photos of ballots acquired by Siganuskaya's database told a very different story. They had received more than 1 million unique images of ballots that were 95% cast in support of her, representing solid evidence of at least around 1 million pro Siganuskaya votes that had been cast, in comparison to the mere 588,000 that were being reported by the government. And that's not to say anything of the votes that were cast in her favor that weren't photographed and sent to the database. The Belarusian government's fraud in favor of Lukashenko was by then obvious to everyone in the country. And so the biggest anti-regime protests in Belarusian history exploded. After her husband was arrested again for campaigning on her behalf and faced more than a decade in prison for allegedly plotting to violently overthrow the Belarusian government, Siganuskaya decided to not take any chances and fled the country in exile at first to Lithuania and later to Poland. She claimed to have won the election with more than 60% of the votes, and has continually ever since led the United Transitional Cabinet in neighboring Poland calling for the peaceful step-down of Lukashenko from power and the transition of Belarus towards a democracy. Meanwhile, the European Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States all subsequently refused to recognize Lukashenko as the legitimate acting president of the country effectively and finally recognizing him as a de facto dictator. More than half a million Belarusians, more than 5% of the country's population, took to the streets across the country in protests demanding Lukashenko's immediate resignation. The whiff of revolution was beginning to fill the air and Lukashenko decided to respond quickly and aggressively to quash it. Lukashenko called on the Belarusian police and army to attack the protests. More than 30,000 arrests were made, and more than 1,300 of the prisoners were injured. Ten more of them were killed, while more than 1,000 of the people arrested reported instances of torture and abuse at the hands of the police. And now, ever fearful of a coup or an assassination plot, Lukashenko then had the Belarusian constitution amended so that in the event of his death, power would be immediately transferred to the 20-person National Security Council that is packed with his own loyalists, and where Lukashenko's eldest son and apparent designated successor, Viktor, is considered to be the informal leader. The constitutional amendment transformed Belarus into a hereditary dictatorship. All pretext of democracy within the country was destroyed, and then came one of the first of several major international clashes between Lukashenko's regime and the West. Ryanair Flight 4978 was a regularly scheduled passenger flight between Athens in Greece and Vilnius in Lithuania. Before reaching Vilnius, the flight flew over Belarusian airspace, and on the 23rd of May in 2021, Belarusian air traffic controllers informed the flight crew that Hamas, a Palestinian organization widely recognized as a terrorist organization, had planted a bomb on board the plane that would detonate were the flight to cross over into Lithuanian airspace. In reality, Hamas had nothing to do with it, and the bomb didn't actually exist. But under the threat of being escorted by Belarusian fighter jets, the flight nonetheless redirected towards the airport at Minsk, the Belarusian capital. And once there, Belarusian police quickly boarded the plane and arrested a well-known Belarusian opposition activist and journalist who was on board, Roman Petrosevich, along with his girlfriend, who was later sentenced to six years in prison for allegedly inciting social hatred. It was a deliberate act of state-sponsored air piracy and terrorism to capture a Belarusian dissident journalist who is critical of the regime, and a harsh response from the West could no longer be contained. The European Union passed fresh sanctions on Lukashenko's regime and banned all Belarusian airlines from European Union airspace, and Lukashenko decided to retaliate by generating another fresh crisis. In July of 2021, he threatened to quote, flood the EU with human traffickers, drug smugglers, and armed migrants. Belavia, the Belarusian state-owned airline, then began increasing the number of connections into Minsk from countries across the Middle East, like Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, 
These connections were also accompanied by a state propaganda campaign promoting tourism to Belarus and guarantees of safe passage from Belarus to Germany, one of the most popular final destinations for migrants to reach from around the world. As many as 8,000 desperate people were deceived by this campaign and flown into Minsk from all of these countries, given wire cutters and axes and then bussed towards the European Union borders with Poland and Lithuania where they were then given instructions by Belarusian authorities to cross. Poland and Lithuania refused their entry and deployed soldiers to the border, while the Belarusian authorities policed their own side and refused to let any of them back into Belarus, continuing to attempt and push them into the European Union. The situation quickly devolved into a humanitarian catastrophe, with thousands of desperate people stuck in a no-man's zone between the EU borders on one side and the Belarusian authorities on the other representing one of the largest incidents of state-sponsored human trafficking in Europe. Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia accused Belarus of waging a hybrid warfare campaign against them, and they all agreed to construct a massive border wall along their mutual borders with Belarus, while additional financial sanctions and pressure were placed on Lukashenko's regime to attempt and punish his policies. And conversely, Russia continued to recognize Lukashenko as the acting president and only doubled down on their support of him which, in essence, left Lukashenko with only the Russians for major international support and backing of his regime. His dependence on Russia to remain in power increased dramatically, and that was the leverage the Russians would use on him a year later when they used Belarus as their highway to invade Ukraine across. Lukashenko simply wasn't in any position to tell the Russians no to basically any of their demands. If he hadn't granted the Russian army military access through his country to attack Ukraine from, the Russians could have abandoned their support for his floundering regime that isn't recognized by anybody in the West leaving him to essentially fend for himself against his own people and the pressure coming in from the pro-democracy exiles in Poland and Lithuania. Or they could have also potentially just liquidated him and replaced him with someone else who would be more open to the Kremlin's desires. Because, you see, the only thing really keeping Lukashenko in power in Belarus are the Belarusian armed forces, which remain largely loyal to Lukashenko personally. But compared to the Russian or even the Ukrainian armed forces, the Belarusian armed forces are vastly inferior. Military service in Belarus is compulsory for all men in the country who generally serve an 18-month term. Because of this, the Belarusian armed forces and reserves are almost entirely made out of conscripts instead of professional volunteers. It's estimated that there are currently around 344,000 men in the reserves and 62,000 additional active duty troops in the armed forces. But Western intelligence currently estimates that as few as 10,000 of those active duty troops are actually combat ready and immediately able to carry out offensive operations. That's not very many. And to make matters even worse, they are nearly universally equipped with old Soviet-era weaponry and equipment that is by this point at least 30 years old, if not even more. This is a force that could not possibly withstand an assault from the Russians, who, despite all of their failings in Ukraine so far, still have hundreds of thousands of combat-ready troops that could quickly cast aside the 10,000 combat-ready Belarusians if they resisted. But they won't resist because Lukashenko is aware of his own vulnerability. And because of that vulnerability, he also doesn't want to commit those precious few troops into a war in Ukraine where many of them are likely to get themselves killed. After the first Russian advance on Kyiv from Belarus failed in early 2022, the Ukrainians learned their lesson and began covering the entire border region with landmines to deter any future offensive coming from the same direction. Were Lukashenko to commit his 10,000 poorly equipped, combat-ready troops to a new attack into Ukraine with the 20,000 Russian troops in the country, it is likely that they would suffer high casualties. And the higher rate of casualties they suffer, the less Belarusian troops would be available at home to safeguard Lukashenko's fragile grip on power from slipping. It's further likely that the Belarusian population would not accept high levels of casualties and long trains of their boys coming back in body bags. Belarus is a country that has long maintained an official policy of neutrality and pacifism, largely owing to its horrific experiences during the Second World War. Located precisely in the center of the bloodlands of Eastern Europe wedged in between Hitler and Stalin, Belarus suffered a higher percentage of their population lost in the war than any other country in the world did. Some 25% or one in four of all Belarusians were wiped out in a matter of four years between 1941 and 1945. 
Belarusian civilians have never wanted to experience the horrors that can be wrought from warfare ever again. And as a consequence, the British think tank Chatham House found last year that 79% of Belarusians believe that the deaths of their soldiers in Ukraine would be an unacceptable cost for their country to bear. Lukashenko's refusal for nearly a year now to send Belarusian troops to fight alongside of the Russians in Ukraine has therefore bought him a kind of goodwill with many Belarusians that would become immediately soured were he to change his mind and send them in anyway. Nonetheless, there has been a notable amount of Belarusian resistance against him for just allowing the Russians to use their country to attack Ukraine. There have been at least 80 reported incidents since the war began of brave Belarusian partisans sabotaging railways in the country to prevent the transport of Russian troops and equipment to the front lines. Despite the Lukashenko regime labeling such sabotage as acts of terrorism that will carry the death penalty by gunshot if caught and convicted. Hundreds of Belarusians with relevant combat experience have also defected and joined the Ukrainian armed forces in their struggle, with many believing that Ukraine's fight against Soviet-era authoritarianism is Belarus's fight as well. If Ukraine emerges completely victorious in the war and Putin loses his grip on power in Russia as a consequence, then Lukashenko will lose his biggest backer and will likely lose his own power as well. Whatever happens in Ukraine is inexorably linked to whatever happens in Belarus. The Belarusian volunteers fighting for Ukraine therefore know that if Lukashenko commits the bulk of the Belarusian armed forces to the invasion, that Belarusian will be fighting against against Belarusian on the soils of Ukraine, and the move will most likely backfire catastrophically for Lukashenko himself. It seems illogical when knowing that how unpopular it would be and how it could easily destabilize his entire regime, that Lukashenko would still send troops in to attack Ukraine alongside of the Russians anyway especially considering how the last attack in 2022 from here went. This is why some expect that the whole move of the Russians in Belarus is just a feint in order to force the Ukrainians to pull back valuable troops from the real front line in the east across the Donbass, where the Russians will concentrate the real upcoming offensive in as their hundreds of thousands of conscripts that began being recruited in September steadily trickle into the front lines. But as illogical as an attack from Belarus into northern Ukraine with Belarusian troops may seem, it also seemed illogical back in February of 2022 for the Russians to invade Ukraine at all. Lukashenko may be getting left with little other choice from Moscow. Almost immediately before the war began, back in January of 2022, Lukashenko ordered another constitutional referendum in Belarus that was held just three days after the Russians invaded Ukraine on the 27th of February. The referendum passed and it enabled him to continue serving as the president of the country until 2034. Five, another 12 years from now, by which point he will be 81 years old. Lukashenko clearly has no expectations of ever giving up his power anytime soon, but the referendum also further binded his regime to the whims of Moscow. They formally renounced Belarus's long policy of neutrality and granted the Russians the right to station their nuclear warheads within Belarusian territory, specifically aimed as a counter if NATO ever deploys nuclear warheads to Poland or Lithuania. If the war in Ukraine continues going worse and worse for Putin and the Russians, they may end up feeling that as a desperate final gamble, it would be worth it to drag the small and beleaguered Belarusian armed forces into the war as well as one last throw of the dice. It's a bad idea, and it would almost certainly result in the collapse of the Lukashenko regime in one way or another, either by a toppling from the domestic pro-democracy activists in Poland, or by being finally absorbed into Russia outright. But if Lukashenko is left with no other choice from Moscow, then it becomes his only choice choice, and it'll be anybody's guess where the chaos that will lead Belarus from there. The Soviet Union may have formally ceased to exist in 1991, but its collapse is still taking place right before our eyes in 2023. The fate of Eastern Europe for generations to come literally hangs in the balance over what will happen over the coming few months. Nearly all across the board, Vladimir Putin's strategy of conquering Ukraine and forcing Europe into looking the other way is floundering. 
Across 2022, the Russians artificially cut their vast deliveries of natural gas through pipelines to Europe that are ordinarily used to fuel European industries and heat European homes throughout the winter. Putin's gamble was that a cold winter without Russian natural gas supplies would lead to freezing European households, which would lead to a spike in natural gas prices that would ruin European industries that usually rely on cheap natural gas as their primary fuel to manufacture products. If that had happened, it would have almost certainly catapulted the European Union into a deep industrial recession and generated domestic unrest and opposition to continuing support for Ukraine in the war. But that's not what's been happening at all. Quite contrary to Putin's hopes, Europe is currently experiencing one of its warmest winters in recorded history. Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Poland, Czechia, Denmark, and the Netherlands all just experienced their warmest January day ever on record, along with more than 900 different towns across Germany, where temperatures have been more similar to springtime conditions than usual winters. Natural gas usage to heat homes has correspondingly been lower, and natural gas prices have largely returned back to their pre-war levels. This unprecedented heat wave in Europe may be saving the continent from Russia's energy blackmail this winter, but it also portends a more long-term, disturbing future, where the European continent's winters are permanently warmer than they have ever been in the past, with all of the corresponding economic, health, and societal damages that that'll entail. Global climate change is one of, if not the, greatest crises of the 21st century, and it's within all of our best interests to try and see it solved before it's too late. I've always been interested in doing whatever I can to help by carbon offsetting my own emissions, but I was always skeptical of that industry and never really participated, until I got contacted by today's sponsor, REN. Everybody's lifestyle in the modern era emits an amount of CO2 into the atmosphere that is contributing, big or small, to the overall global climate crisis. But REN is a simple and effective way to make your own personal difference. By answering a few quick questions about your lifestyle, they offer you an easy way to calculate your own carbon footprint, and then show you how you can reduce it by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects like tree planting, mineral weathering, or rainforest protection. And what I personally love the most about REN is that whenever you sign up to make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint, they'll send you monthly updates from each of the projects that you support so that you get to see exactly what your money is being spent on, complete with photos and details on every tree planted, every acre of rainforest protected, and every ton of carbon offset. And as someone from California with direct family members in the state who've been forced to evacuate their homes due to approaching wild fires. I've been particularly interested in their projects supporting biochar in California, which is aimed at preventing future wildfires in the state by removing dead and flammable trees and turning those dead trees' biomass into biochar, which serves the additional benefit of keeping carbon out of the air for thousands of years. All in all, it'll take a lot from all of us to end the climate crisis, and REN is what I'll be using going forward for all of my own personal carbon offsetting, and I think you should too. Doing all of this probably costs a lot less than you think it does, and it's even less considering that when you click the button here on your screen right now, or head to the link down in the description below, they'll actually pay to offset the first month of emissions for the first 100 people who sign up. It's a great way to genuinely help fight against the climate crisis and help support real-life lore at the same time, and as always, thank you so much for watching.